Hello, everybody. So thank you very much for coming to, to this session. So today we have uh, Lorisa Soldatova. So I met Lorisa now, I guess, 10 years ago or so. No, it's when we saw each other last time. <laughs> yeah, that was the last so time. Was 15 years <laughs> ago. Before that, so I was doing my, my postdoc at the University of Manchester. And Lorisa at that time she worked with uh, Brunel. Yes. Uh, we were uh, working with the EPSRC uh, project. Uh, so it's very glad to, to have you here. So Lorisa is now a professor in data science in Goldsmiths University in London. Um, you can see that uh, Lorisa, you have led a lot of uh, research projects, particularly with the EPSRC. So there is uh, one in a, a action that is called on, on, on cancer that is still uh, running. Yeah. Hopefully it's, it's going yeah. uh, well. Uh, and then you were coordinator of the European project uh, Adalab. Uh, I guess that um, today uh, you are bringing us all your experience with uh, the robot scientists, uh, yeah. all these uh, things, very interesting things with the so in the area of artificial intelligence and data science. Um, so thank you again for, for coming, for being with us. Thank you, Ivan. It's uh, very nice to hear your <laughs> informal introduction. <laughs> and thank you for inviting me. I have never been to your university before, but I'm external examiner for data science program. And my impression is extremely good from working with you guys and I also very pleased to see how many people are joined online and there are even people in person in the room so that is even better so thank you for coming and thank you for joining before I start because I tend to forget to give credits and thank funders um, so what I will be presenting today, recent uh, advances, it's done with Chalmers University of Technology in Sweden. It's a group of people. Uh, Ross King is the leader of this project well for over 20 years and uh, I joined the project in 2004, so it has been a long time. Uh, and uh, Mainly what I will be talking today about, it's about the new database and this work is done by ThoughtWorks. It's a global technology company, it's international companies, they have uh, offices all around the world, but we are working with the research group in India. And uh, I believe they just did brilliant work. And um, today I just want to... Yes, funding. I also would like to thank funders <laughs> before <laughs> I start again because I can forget about it. So I will be talking about robot scientists. This is already several generations and this new stage, new work is um, Genesis. It's a new robot scientist and it is funded by WASPES. Wallenberg AI Autonomous System and Software Program in Sweden. This is private um, uh, funding. It's uh, probably the richest family in Sweden that uh, very charitable and uh, fund a lot of research projects. So it's very prestigious to receive funding from them and they funded this new robot scientist. Um, uh, and then, yes, uh, we will <laughs> quite successful with several applications to EBSRC, have several projects and um, yes, Ivan mentioned, so the current project is Action on Cancer. We're applying now this system to advise on decisions uh, on cancer treatments and another project, uh, so it is current funding. Ambition is, yes, it's focusing on integration of different parts of robot scientists and uh, this database, the uh, uh, key part that I will be talking about is funded by ThoughtWorks company. Somehow go back. 
yes. Okay, I think I will master <laughs> the slides by the end. <laughs> so, finally, what I will be talking about. So, I will uh, tell quite briefly about the uh, robot scientist. I today just learned that the Ruskin actually was given talk here some time ago. So, but in case if you don't know about it, I will tell about it. And in case if you heard about it, then I will not tell too much about it. So I will uh, say a few words about the, the lab project because this is what led to the next uh, stage in this project. It's robot scientist genesis. And uh, the new part is um, database solutions for genesis. So I will try to summarize uh, these 20 years of experience of working with robot scientists and what problems in handling data we experienced and how we think it should be reflected in more contemporary approaches for database design. And I hope that for you people working in uh, data analytics, machine learning, so it's of essence to know what is happening in this space. So how data are going to be collected and uh, what are requirements for it. OK, so. The concept of robot scientist was introduced now more than 20 years ago. Uh, it is an AI system that is capable of performing the whole cycle of scientific investigation. So it can generate research hypotheses, design experiments to test this hypothesis, physically execute these experiments, analyze results, hopefully discover something new, updated background knowledge, and so on. So, of course, it's not all science like that, but the experiment-based science, uh, this is classic model. And if you talk about data science, okay, experiments are computational, not in lab, but uh, again, it's uh, pretty much the same cycle. And uh, the first system, that actually did something like that was Adam, a discovery machine. It's um, specialized in functional genomic, and then there was another robot scientist, Eve, that specialized in drug discovery. And um, Adam was uh, the first system that made the uh, fully automated scientific discoveries. So there was quite a lot of splash about it. So it was listed like one of top discoveries in 2009. So it's well over 10 years ago. But surprisingly, robot scientists still didn't take over the world. <laughs> so there are more robot scientists are appearing. There is uh, robot statisticians, there is uh, chemists, but uh, I think it's only now it's really starting to pick up. So far, just the, like parts of this technology were adopted, but not like a whole system. So if if also was quite successful, if uh, specialized on neglected diseases and neglected because um, it's not profitable for uh, pharmaceutical companies to invest uh, in uh, dealing with this disease because uh, people who suffer from them just cannot pay much for drugs and, for example, malaria. So there are treatments, but they are not very effective. And they have horrible side effects, so there are still serious problems. And if, uh, if um, one of projects was to uh, take already approved drugs and try to reposition them. And one of the interesting uh, suggestion by if was uh, the triclosan, it's a um, component that uh, regularly used in toothpaste, is actually quite effective against malaria. Uh, and moreover, it doesn't develop resistance. So, uh, so this is what is called leads. So it's not like a new drug but it's a good suggestion to do more studies, so it's like lead discoveries. So, but more importantly, if um, uh, 
used a lot of active machine learning to do more intelligent drug design. So instead of doing mass screening, when pharmaceutical companies are used, they have millions of compounds, they take them, screen, see if there is some activity, cherry pick them and then study deeper. So in our lab, we just couldn't afford it. We are academics, we <laughs> you know how much projects <laughs> are. So we had to be very clever, intelligent. So uh, we could uh, like run experiments with 20 drugs. If there is something, then we could switch on active machine learning and direct what next compound to test what gives you maximum chance of see some activity. And we showed that this is a more efficient uh, approach for drug design. Okay, so it was if. And um, if was used for this project, other lab, an adaptive automated scientific laboratory. So in this project, we uh, focused on closed loop investigation. So there is a lot of automation, lab automation, there is a lot of machine learning, but they are still quite disconnected. For example, in system biology, so they simulate models if they have money, if uh, time permits, they run experiments to verify if predictions are accurate or not. Even that is not uh, always done, but in a real cycle of scientific investigation, these results, whether the simulations work validated experimentally or not should go immediately back to improve model and make new predictions, a new simulation. And uh, this is what we were doing, making this automated cycle of um, systems biology models, the software part, there was a lot of machine learning tools uh, trying to detect what to change, what to remove and that it's physically connected to robotic labs that actually checking all these predictions and then it goes back. So we also in this project looked at an interaction between what we believe future lab is between robot and human scientists. So uh, we reflected with help of some philosophers. <laughs> so what actually humans are still better and where robots are better. Uh, we didn't progress much with that, but uh, we definitely identified these um, ways of interacting, how information can be passed. Okay, the application domain. Uh, so we, we, we need to experiment on some things, and we selected uh, what is called the dioxic shift. It's a very interesting phenomenon. phenomenon. So, uh, so yeast, it's uh, used for making beer and bread. So it's a model organism because it multiplies very quickly. And uh, it still shares a lot of genes with humans. So, uh, and of course, it's much easier to experiment with yeast than with humans. So what is true for yeast, often true for humans. And this dioxic shift, it's a very interesting effect. So in normal circumstances, yeast uh, consume glucose and produce ethanol. So this is how bread is made, this is how beer is made. But if you starve uh, yeast cells for some time, something is happening, metabolic processes change, and it starts consuming ethanol and produce CO2. But what is interesting, then it lives longer. So it doesn't happen all the time. So even that is unknown. So, so there is switch when it's happening, when it's not happening. And something similar was observed in other organisms. In C. elegans, this worms, in uh, mice, I think it was in female, not in male. So, so there is quite consistent evidence that if an organism starving for some extended period of time, something happening to metabolic processes, some switch happening, quite fundamental changes, but one of side effects is that uh, this organism lives longer. So it uh, 
concern research and aging and also uh, it believes that this switch is also related to cancer so it's also a signaling problem so it's a very interesting problem biologically and for us it was a good area because um, not much done not much understood so we picked up what is done so here's reference it was the best model for yeast dioxic shift. Uh, actually, we had to improve even that model because it just was collection of some links. It was even not executable. We, we cannot even measure the performance of this model. So we took this model and uh, we combine cell signaling model and this metabolic model because it, it's clear that something happening with signaling. So, we produce this initial model. So this itself, it was already quite a big step forward, but we needed this initial step to have something executable, something which we could work with, simulate and measure performance. And then we started this uh, cycles of investigation. So there were many tools developed um, uh, trying to analyze existing data sets and given you suggestion, what links to add, what nodes to remove. Surprisingly, surprisingly, after removing some nodes, models started to perform better. So obviously there was some wrong information there. But ultimately, ultimately, there was quite a lot of new nodes and new edges added. And the simulation were run, predictions were made, it was connected to real lab equipment that performed real experiments. All these data sets were again consumed. Again, decision was made what not to add, what to remove. Uh, again, simulation of models, predictions, again, experiments. So, project run for four years, we managed to make three cycles. <laughs> so, not fully, so, but. Uh, it was slow, but we still can claim, especially the last cycle, it was uh, automatic. So machine learning tools directly sent information to the lab. They designed experiments, so what to test, and the back again, it was consumed. So we developed a whole protocol exchange of data, how machine learning can interact with lab systems. So and I believe it is the state of the art because it remains quite disconnected. So this work, it was like proof of principle that uh, this is how it should be done. Cycles of investigation. Uh, then you can really improve these complex uh, models. But in the reality, to have high fidelity models, you need probably hundreds or even thousands of such cycles. Uh, so current state of automation in the AI just not there yet. It's very limited. I think we were really pioneering in this area and uh, so it was very hard to do. And for many reasons, one of reasons that yes, um, just integration of equipment is a huge problem. It's uh, appropriate equipment different so there is a lot of work in standardizing them so at least they can interact with uh, different components within lab but when you add software to it machine learning software it's just a new level of complexity and there are no any standards that cover all of it like the whole cycle of investigation so it's very fragmented uh, and a lot of gaps so it was the main problem so I would say technology is already there, but it's still separated, fragmented, not integrated. And this is the goal of the next project, Genesis, third so generation of robot scientists, to develop a system so it's like more industrial level that capable of doing it. So Genesis is commissioned uh, to start working in 2023. So some bits already assembled, so it's still <laughs> in parts. 
uh, but the target is to run yeah, thousands, 10,000 of this uh, closed loop automated. And it's like equivalent of thousands of biologists working in a lab in parallel. And it still will have capability to generate hypotheses, design experiments, execute them, analyze the results, and improve complex biological systems, biology models. So this is the vision. So at the heart of Genesis uh, hardware are microfluidic uh, systems. So it's uh, this uh, microbioreactors that uh, okay it's not my area of research but i was advised that it's quite advanced technology and it allows uh, more flexibility like uh, you can control them all separately and uh, there is a wide range of biological condition and there will be many other wonderful things that it can do so so just from Biological lab capabilities are fantastic. Uh, but uh, I'm a computer scientist and <laughs> I'm more interested in the data aspect of it. So what we observed during working on these robot scientists, so there are more and more data so we all know about big data but just imagine when such systems are working it's a different level uh, then we all hear about reproducibility crisis sustainability so with this volume and complexity uh, will it make everything worse or better and uh, Yes, biological systems just notoriously complex and uh, technology is getting more complex and there are so many inconsistencies between labs. So this is like the context. So we tried to reflect on all this and uh, we came up with uh, suggestions for requirements for new databases. So when they are designed, for such system like robot scientists, for automated systems that is part of some complex systems that this is something that the developers should take care of. So yes, the databases need to be able to handle bigger and bigger, and bigger volumes of data. So uh, yes, uh, there are technologies, uh, big data technologies, it's a flourishing area, but uh, this is a new scale. So this is an example, it just one this uh, plate and there will be like 10,000 of them and how much data points they are producing. So we have big data before this system came to existence. So there are only few of them. When they will start producing data, we will need new solutions. Then stable and reliable access to data sources. So these systems are working not only with data sets that they are producing, they are also accessing external databases. So they try to put together all available data, what everything was they can harvest. And apart from different data schemas, data integration problem, it, it's actually very difficult to access them because um, they are designed for providing access to human users. And when software agents are accessing, they can do it in different ways. And of course, uh, the databases are being modified and they try to preserve access, but they think about human users. Even slight change in metadata somewhere can cause serious problems for software agents. And they, they, they collect like unmanned logs, but it's again, it's not in machine processable form. So you cannot automate the whole process. So what was changed? Amend your code. So several times just all work with robot sciences stopped because uh, researchers had to manually investigate what is happening with the sources, amend code of Adam and Eve. So ultimately we ended up storing internally all external data sources that were used because it's just so disruptive. 
So if you think about future, so developers of database just should think about not only human, but also AI agent systems. Then machine interpretability of data and uh, metadata. So uh, yes, it's very important again. Uh, so this system, intelligent system, the more they know, the more intelligent they are. So they are not working just with tables. They need to know a lot about it, like they need to know how it was collected, what it is for. So the more structured information, the more met uh, metadata. And uh, it probably was the biggest limitation of previous system on them if they, they didn't have access to enough knowledge. So they could, with some difficulty, access data, but the rest was not in machine processable format. So we had to model everything by ourselves. Uh, another requirement is suitability for autonomous reasoning. So uh, this system relies on flawless logic. So they, it's not only compatibility, but data schemas, they, they, they should be so crisp because if even slight deviation can cause serious problem when down line it's very difficult to then assess logical implications and what, what, what is wrong so the simpler the cleaner the better so what works for human may not work for ai agents then handling increased complexity so biomedical systems are incredibly complex, um, data heterogeneous, uh, uh, more and more knowledge sources uh, becoming available, hopefully in machine interpretable format. Uh, but uh, it's all growing, getting more complex. So first, uh, it needs uh, to be consumed all together. So to make changes, updates, so it all needs to be very flexible, easily extendable, because our knowledge is changing all the time, and yes, how to handle it all. Uh, yes, facilitating reproducibility, because um, if it is not done, uh, no one will trust to this AI systems. So everything needs to be traceable, uh, accountable for, and uh, this is just foundation uh, when just the in our project the uh, application in cancer advising on what treatment to recommend if, if, if doctors clinicians cannot trace what this decision is based on why it is recommended no one is going to use it No, and this uh, just as a thought, so that we try to shape as uh, requirements. Hopefully someone will pay attention to it. <laughs> so it's like, yes, 20 years of uh, collection of all these problems and where we're heading. And this is how we think it should be features of contemporary database. Um, so laboratory data needs to be explored at all stages of scientific activities. So from hypothesis, analysis, experimental protocol, uh, meta-analysis, so they all need to be connected. Uh, suitable for machine learning, so it needs uh, high performance, so, it, so machine learning tools need to be able to access it very frequently, re reliably, with minimal loss of meaning of that data. And yes, it needs to be scalable, portable, flexible, to different computing environments, because it's, it's complex systems they will be distributed. So yes, it's a lot to ask for, but this is where we all head in. And for this new robot scientists, we attempted to be at least mindful of these requirements. And we developed a database for this system, Genesis Database. And then this is what I would like to tell you about today. So it is an ontology-based database uh, system, so it's based on formal uh, schema. 
So previous uh, robot scientists, they also had underlying ontology, but uh, frankly, it was actually not very connected with database or data schemas because developed by different people and some just go their own way. And <laughs> so even within one group, it was very difficult. So uh, this time, for the first time, we have database that really driven by uh, ontological, formal, logical representation. So it is designed to use and reuse large quantities of structured domain information, so it can handle this complexity. So it is focusing on metabolomic mass spectrometry data, RNA seq data and microbial growth profiling data, but uh, yes, uh, design principle can be applied to other areas. So I don't expect you to see what is on the figure, is just to show that there is an ontology. <coughs> and it is very modular, so we can, if there are new functionality, something else, we can add just another module or something if to change. So you can do within that module. So it's we tested it. It's easy to modify. It's easy to extend, and it is compatible with existing standards. So it will be easier to integrate with other sources. So again, I don't expect you to see everything on this slide. The idea is that um, it reflects structure of experimental data. And you see it is complex, so no way you can put it into a table. So if you want to capture what actually is happening, you you, you need uh, quite complex structures. So, so there are still tables, <laughs> but there is a lot of this contextual information. And um, yes, it's hierarchical structure. It is distributed across multiple servers. It grows very fast. So Genesis is not working yet. So only this uh, some parts of it, we, we just started testing and, and it's already growing. <laughs> so what will happen in future? And yes, yeah, so it's uh, it's complex system. So just nature of this data says transcriptometry and mass spectrometry. I was advised it's very different. Just to put it together, it's already tricky. So yes, users are spared from all these complexities. They just have um, API interface. They just can query it and what is happening behind all this complexity and uh, how it is connected. They don't need to worry about it. But uh, because it's all anchored to this uh, unified ontological representation, so it's all consistent, uh, consistent access, and uh, yeah, it can be quite complex queries. So this is something what we tested. So this is an example uh, when a query uh, like gene A is an inhibitor of gene T in low oxygen, high sugar environments. So this is example of uh, queries that uh, this database can support. So what is happening? So there are actually different software agents that needs access to this database. So here in this example, so there is highly corned algorithm that is working on reconstructing this gene regulatory network. So this query goes from it to database and it extracts not only data, but also different experimental conditions like that was the oxygen level and blah, blah, blah. Using this, another agent can form new hypothesis about what is missing in the gene regulatory regulatory interaction, and another engine can design this experiment to test if this hypothesis is correct or not. So you need several such steps to reconstruct this regulation network, and uh, these uh, software agents that are doing it, and they all need access to this database, and this database can provide them very quickly. So, so they constantly can go back and forth. So in split of second, I will so yes, yeah, so in this example, we tested so less than a second and it's huge volumes of data. So it was more than 10,000 experiments. This is 
this space this is total triplets 1.5 billion so this database already contains and um, Yes, this is machine specification. So we believe that it is a huge step forward in database designs that we finally have a database that can support the needs of such system, at least Genesis, and it's uh, <laughs> quite an ambitious system. Two messages uh, <laughs> take with you from this talk. So a new generation of robot scientists, the genesis hopefully will be functioning soon in the next year producing huge amounts of useful information and uh, we developed the genesis database that uh, can handle this data and provide access not only for human users but it's from the beginning it was specifically designed for machine learning tools to uh, access it and interact with it and also for lab equipment to take command and do experiments. So and we believe this is uh, the future how databases will be developed for intelligent systems. Yes, and um, I would like to finish this talk by uh, telling you about Turing Nobel Prize challenge. So people all, all often ask, so discoveries by robot scientists are quite limited. Yes, there are discoveries, but it's more like research assistant, not an independent scientist. So there is a proposal by Kitana Sensei. So Professor Kitana, he was the person who originated this robot cup. So his challenge that the team of robots will beat best human team in football and uh, stimulated a lot of research. So he is now announce, announcing this challenge, Nobel Prize challenge, that by 2050, AI system will be able to make major scientific discoveries at this worth of a Nobel Prize. So create truly, truly intelligent robot scientists. I hope we will be around to see it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Larissa, for your very nice talk. What I will try now is I will uh, try to uh, listen to uh, mm -hmm. yeah questions that mm -hmm. the online audience will mm -hmm. have and Ivan will try to make sure that the people who are sitting here can ask their questions. So shall we start here or is there any question? Thank you. It's a really good question. Uh, so indeed, things sometimes go wrong. For example, in any biological labs, things sometimes go wrong. And uh, no, to start with, if absolutely everything is recorded, uh, then uh, all failures are recorded too. So you you are not achieving results that were predicted. So you can see that something is wrong, but we never, never actually analyzed it. And uh, the were requests, please give us all data. So uh, because you can learn from negative examples uh, as much from positives. But uh, yeah, we were focusing only when it goes correctly. And if something goes wrong, we discard it. So data, but they actually were recorded just because the systems were designed like that. 
but uh, yeah, we never analyzed it. Uh, the only example I can give when things went seriously wrongly, it is when producer of these plates, where all experiments are done, change coating. And they even didn't tell us. So it's the same plate, looks like that, but all results were different. And it took like two months to figure out what is wrong. <laughs> so uh, for commercial uh, reasons, they wouldn't uh, tell composition of this coating. So we still don't know <laughs> what, what, what is actually. So, so this is a good question about how much you actually need to record. So we saw that we are recording everything, but there is still information that we don't know, like what these plates are made from. And when something was changed, so for two months, just everything was wrong. So. But at least in our system, we can detect when things are wrong and discard the data. Yes. So I have a question mm -hmm. uh, from the online audience. Um, so mm -hmm. Alex Henderson asks if you managed to reuse the ontologies uh, from Adam and Eve, or did mm -hmm. you have to develop completely mm -hmm. new ontologies? Uh, no, we. Uh, what is possible? Uh, we are reusing and not only from previous robot scientists, but also whatever we find relevant, <laughs> we follow good practice and we try to import already defined classes and define only what is new about this system. So I wish all the database developers would do the same. <laughs> so Alex, did that answer your question? Let's hope that this is the case. There's another question here. Uh, some people sent it for a nice talk. Um, I, I'm not a uh, uh, low fact, it's, uh, but I, I do use some uh, machine learning algorithms. Mm -hmm. So currently, uh, what we are using based on the combination of human beings with mm -hmm. uh, uh, PC or uh, mm -hmm. workstation. Um, However, I just wonder the, uh, for such a combination of, uh, uh, say, robots with machine learning, uh, how can you measure uh, or how uh, how can you demonstrate uh, the uh, the uh, robot scientists outperform mm -hmm. uh, human beings with computers? Mm -hmm. Are there any metrics? So one of our ambitions already for several years, and fingers crossed, <laughs> we applied for funding, fingers crossed. So we want to run uh, like this grand challenge. So we want to um, make a comparison, uh, like AI system proposing treatments and the human expert proposing treatments. Of course, we will not treat human, but in cancer research, there is um, now very promising approach. It's um, xenograph, so it's de-immunized mice. Uh, they are injected with uh, tumor cells. Uh, it's very expensive, so it's like $1,000 per mouse, but it's uh, an accurate model, a live model, biological model of what is happening with the cancer patient. And we want to take a group of such mice and treat them. Half of them will be treated with what AI system proposing and half will be treated with what the human experts are proposing and then compare performance. This is that, that would be a good experiment, but it's very expensive and if we get funding, we would love to do that. That would be, uh, it would answer many questions, yes. But uh, otherwise, uh, no, yeah, we can measure certain performances, but uh, ultimately what the system is for, if it is for decision making, then we need to compare decisions, quality of decisions. Mm -hmm. uh, 
have a, a couple of questions. So the, the my first question is about this uh, Genesis database. Mm -hmm. I can see that you are using the RDF. Uh, yes, we use the RDF. Uh, so just I wonder is how in terms of machine learning, because most of the machine learning systems, they are not very, uh, they can't handle the RDF uh, representation, so they tend to work with you know, spreadsheet. And so you, are, you need to transform all of that into... Uh, so, uh, I talked a little bit about the Andalab project. So it is where <laughs> we really, had a close look at the communication between machine learning and the uh, labs. And uh, so machine learning tools were able to access uh, very easily, it, but if logic is simple, and uh, we ultimately represented it all in YAML, so machine learning tools could access it with no restrictions whatsoever. But if you manage to keep this streamlined logic without too much complexity, so it's like not full RDF, like very clean subset. Mm -hmm. So that is why I'm saying that it should be designed for machine learning tools, so that they could access directly, so manage to do it. Because, I mean, I remember that in the past, uh, you know, you've seen the uh, inductive yeah, we use data logs. So initially we were translating everything to data log. Okay. So data log also could be processed. Uh, but then it was all in YAML. It's essentially it's XML. Okay. So, okay. so so uh, there were no program with access. I mean, the, the, another question I have is, uh, what, what is the, the, the input for a uh, proper science? So, I mean, uh, typically, when we are analyzing mm -hmm. something using data, mm -hmm. so we have a, a problem, um, task that is probably classification, regression, and like that, and then the system predicts and all of that. But in, in this case, my understanding is that the, the raw scientist is implementing the whole uh, scientific method for the developing hypothesis. Yes, and this is, a, again, it's a good question. So this is where I believe is a major shift. So this intelligence system, they need not only data, they need a lot of data. So input, of course, data sets, external data sets, internal data sets that produce, but to make them intelligent, to discover something, they need knowledge. And then for what form this knowledge is supplied, yes, it's a big question. So in this case, it's in the form of model. So this complex uh, systems biology model, like uh, this dog six shift. So it was binary model, uh, nodes, links, uh, sometimes weights. Uh, in previous system, it was in first order logic, just encoded all chemical reactions. So whatever form it is, it has to be machine processable. It has to be fully compatible with data data sets, so uh, that is uh, where everything is heading. So data is no longer enough. It's not just big data, we are moving to knowledge. You need more and more rules, models, something executables, what you can simulate, so reason with. So it's, that, that is why there are many different tools doing different things they need to orchestrate it all together and then physically verify if what they're predicting is correct. Thank you very much. It was really interesting. Thank you. There are no questions from the online audience at the moment. No, Stan, uh, I would like to thank you for good questions and uh, inviting me here. I don't travel much <laughs> since pandemic. It is starting to change, but I still enjoy just to go somewhere. <laughs>
<laughs> no, and it's good to see people who are enthusiastic about what they do and coming to research seminars and asking good questions. <laughs> so thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you very much, Lisa, for being here with us and sharing more interesting information. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.